Italia, sotto la guida dell'Ittorio, inquadrata in tutte le sue formazioni rivoluzionarie, attingerà i suoi destini. Arriverà al benessere, alla potenza e alla gloria. Benito Mussolini was a born actor. He had remarkable powers of leadership and the capacity to inspire. But his dream of creating by conquest a second Roman Empire was fated to collapse. Italy was too backward and too weak to engage in major wars. Mussolini's elder son Vittorio, now aged 73, visits his father's tomb in Predapio in northern Italy. Mussolini had been shot by Italian communist partisans at the end of the war. Vittorio remembers the ambitions of his father. Mio padre, Benito Mussolini. My father, Benito Mussolini, had a big dream. He wanted a strong and fierce Italy respected for its law and order and highest form of social justice. He wanted a new Italian character, worthy of its Roman heritage and the brilliance of the Renaissance. Such a race could have been amongst the future leaders of the world. To recapture the power and glory of ancient Rome, had been the dream of Italian nationalists since the unification of Italy in 1870. They believed that to make the nation great must be the first objective of government. For many Italians, reality was far from glorious. Many lived in extreme poverty, and emigration offered the only hope of a decent life. In the First World War, thousands of young men had fought for a better future. Italy had joined the Allies in 1915 in return for a promise of colonies. When the promise was broken, Italians felt cheated. Nearly half a million men had been killed in a war that crippled the economy and spawned social tensions which made Italy all but ungovernable. At the end of the First World War, Italy was in a state of total chaos and on the brink of a communist revolution. Rioting, anarchy, endless strikes, aggression and violence of every shape and form. When we, the Italian soldiers, came back from the trenches after three hard years of living and breathing the air of all the dead men around us, instead of being welcomed back by the Italian flag, we were met by the red communist one, as well as stones and insults. As opposing political groups fought for power in the streets, Many ex-servicemen joined a new, ardently nationalist movement, the Fasci di Combattimento, the Fascist Party. Its uniform was the black shirt, its objective to destroy communism and liberalism and build a powerful authoritarian Italy. Their leader was Benito Mussolini, a revolutionary socialist of peasant stock who became a nationalist and fought in the war. He was a talented, popular journalist and a gifted speaker who attracted mass support by telling Italians that he would make them great, that fascism would sweep away corrupt and inefficient government, revise the peace settlements in Italy's favor, and create a new empire based on Rome, the cradle of Western civilization. Ugo Peretti was a founder member of the fascist party in Milan and a veteran of many street fights. 
Ci sono stati dei combattimenti violentissimi. There used to be some extremely violent battles with deaths on both sides. Diversi morti. Quando riuscivamo a capire When we managed to catch our attackers, we'd take them back to the center and give them a beating. We'd also give them a nice glass of castor oil, which turned out to be a very effective weapon. I must say that they used to be more afraid of the castor oil than the truncheon. In October 1922, Mussolini felt strong enough to make a bid for power and his private army of fascist action squads staged a march on Rome. The leader himself remained in Milan. In fascist folklore, it became the overture to Mussolini's revolution. To prevent a fascist coup, the government had asked King Victor Emmanuel to call out the army, but the king, fearful of civil war, refused. He asked Mussolini to form a government. At first, Mussolini shared power with other parties, but within three years, he had created a single party state. Mussolini, prese l'Italia. Mussolini found Italy in a state of chaos, a civil war almost. There is no doubt that he managed to turn Italy into a country that enjoyed law and order, that had no strikes, and where the trains ran on time. You didn't have those street fights between fascist squads and Marxists, which were so common before fascism. However, as far as we, the anti-fascists, were concerned, he secured law and order at the expense of freedom. It's very easy to describe the repression. There was no freedom of the press. You could not publish a newspaper. Nor could you write for an existing newspaper and say things against fascism. You couldn't hold public meetings and say what you thought. Parliament was wiped out. You could not vote for the MP of your choice. Workers had to behave and get on with their work without making a nuisance of themselves. And trade unions were practically instruments of fascism. That was the nature of fascist oppression. Mussolini's staunchest opponents were the communists. In the early years, the party's newspapers were burned in the streets. Many anti-fascists emigrated. Of those who remained, some 6,000 were imprisoned or exiled. Mario Vigna was a member of the Communist Party in Ravenna. In 1930, I was arrested and taken to the police headquarters where I was badly beaten up. Because I wouldn't tell them the names of my comrades, they tested my resistance by sticking a red-hot iron into my chest. But I said nothing, not a word. After that terrible experience, I was sent to Rome, tried and sentenced to 10 years imprisonment. Fascism was, of course, a totalitarian state. In fact, this word adopted by every totalitarian state since can be traced back to that famous phrase of Mussolini's written on every wall in the country. Everything within the state, nothing outside the state, nothing against the state. But as people in Italy often said jokingly then, it was a totalitarian state revised and diluted by the almost total lack of respect for its laws. Corretto, mitigato, attenuato dalla uh, quasi universale inosservanza delle leggi. Questo dipendeva. This was due to the nature of the Italians, who didn't pay much attention to the severity of fascist laws and their penalties. Alla severità delle leggi e delle eventuali sanzioni. There were two other moderating influences: the monarchy and the Roman Catholic Church. Unable to dominate either institution, Mussolini took pains to gain the support of both. The status of the Vatican was raised to that of a sovereign state, and the church restored to its position of authority in Italian society.
There were positive achievements too, all much magnified by fascist propaganda. Mussolini launched badly needed public works. Productivity rose on the farms, in the factories, and in the mines. Grateful foreign tourists noticed that the trains ran on time. And by taxing bachelors and rewarding mothers, Mussolini reversed the decline in the birth rate. 93 women produced 1,300 children between them. The battle for births, as it was called, would produce a new generation of Italians. Mens sana in corpore sano. È un chiarissimo monito che si ripete da secoli, ma che dopo Roma i pedagoghi avevano spesso dimenticato o mal interpretato. As regards the Italians, he wished above all to change their character. He thought this was necessary because centuries of subjugation and disease had turned the Italians into rather weak and servile people. He wanted to improve their morale through education and their physical prowess through sport and specially prepared military gymnastic programs. Also, there was an education, which we could call warlike, that was meant to teach the Italians, who are on the whole a peace-loving people and not at all aggressive, how to fight a war should the necessity arise. The regime's prestige abroad was boosted in those years by spectacular feats of daring. In 1933, the Air Minister, General Balbo, led 24 flying boats across the Atlantic. Balbo and his fellow pilots broke all records, an achievement that earned them a hero's welcome in New York. New York gave General Balbo and his Italian flyers a roaring welcome as they paraded up Broadway in traditional style amid a hail of paper. As the airmen passed along the Grand Canyon of skyscrapers, the scene resembled a heavy snowfall. Hundreds of thousands lined both sides of the street, from the Battery to City Hall, and cheered the smiling general as he passed by. We were proud to talk about martyrs and heroes. It was important for us to be able to do that. No one had ever talked like that before the First World War. Now we talk about sacrifices and the dead. Not only that, but of past glories, Roman glories, etc. We were all glad to feel that we belonged to a strong, noble country that was renowned. We liked this situation. Mussolini was the dux, or duce the leader. It has been said of him that he was more popular in Italy than anyone had ever been and probably ever will be. Mussolini saw himself as the national role model, the personification of the masculine virtues. No, the people followed Mussolini rather than fascism. The people were carried away, fascinated by him. He had a special kind of magnetism which enchanted the people. They supported Mussolini rather than the fascist party. In public, Mussolini was a great actor. He knew how to charm the people and make everyone feel involved. Mussolini 
Mussolini was a powerful figure. A glance, a gesture was enough to send the crowd into raptures. People used to become oblivious of everything but their idol and shout with tremendous enthusiasm. There and then, they had faith because the Duce wanted them to have faith in fascism, that fascist faith for which the applause would go on and on and on. Fascism was supported mainly by the lower middle classes and the middle classes. Agricultural workers in certain areas were also attracted to fascism, but they did so primarily because it was in their tradition to respect the authority of the state. In the operario, we have a different situation, that is, the situation was a little different where the workers were concerned. Initially, they were anti. But as the old ones died and the new generation grew up, they too supported fascism. To start with, a lot of people belonged because they believed in it. Some belonged for other reasons. In fact, there were those who joined the party because they needed work. To become a state employee, it was necessary to produce the party membership card, which was also known mockingly as the meal ticket. An essential characteristic of the regime was the cultivation of militarism. Mussolini was determined to change the nature of Italians and make them dynamic and instinctively aggressive. Il Partito Nazionale Fascista è un esercito o se voi volete ancora è un ordine nel quale si entra per servire e per obbedire. Like Hitler in Germany, Mussolini declared that war alone could make a people truly noble. Only blood could turn the blood-stained wheels of history. To remain healthy, he said, a nation should make war every 25 years. Much of Mussolini's overblown rhetoric was part of the show. He talked about eight million bayonets and an air force large enough to blot out the sun. But it was a show with a purpose. Only an aggressive, self-confident Italy, prepared to make war when the right moment came, could earn the respect of the world. From the age of eight, all children were made to march with guns. Better one day as a lion, said Mussolini, than a hundred years as a sheep. The main objective was internal. It was meant to create a fighting spirit and to give the impression that the country was a very important one and that fascism was going to achieve historic goals which it would have to do sooner or later through conflict. This sort of boasting was also meant to impress countries abroad. But where that was concerned, he was more cautious. You play the role of the warrior and the peacemaker according to the occasion. In the role of European statesman, Mussolini was an opportunist. He was anxious that Italy be accepted alongside Britain and France as one of the arbiters of Europe. His moderation earned him powerful friends abroad, including Austin Chamberlain, then Britain's foreign secretary. I trust his word when given and I think that we might easily go far before finding an Italian with whom it would be as easy for the British government to work. 
1933, Hitler became leader of a resurgent Germany. It was an event that was bound to change the European balance of power. Mussolini was wary of Hitler's declared designs on Austria. An Anschluss or Union would bring Germany to Italy's northern frontier. An independent Austria was vital for Italy. The state funeral of the Austrian Chancellor Dollfuss in 1934 confirmed Mussolini's fears. For Dollfuss had been murdered by the Nazis in an attempted coup. Mussolini held Hitler responsible. Dollfuss had been a close friend. He sent Italian troops to the border with Austria. The coup fizzled out. Once in Rome, we went immediately to Villa Tolonia and met Mussolini, who was extremely angry, and told us that his friend Dolfus, whose wife was, at the time, the guest of Donna Rachele in Riccione, had been brutally and barbarically killed in Vienna under Hitler's orders, adding, as is well known, that the German dictator was a barbarian, a criminal and a pederast. Noi possiamo parlare con un sovrano disprezzo. Talune dottrine d'altralpe. Di gente che ignorava la scrittura con la quale tramandare i documenti della propria vita in un tempo in cui Roma aveva Cesare, Virgilio ed Augusto. Italy had a powerful fleet, but her second-class status in the Mediterranean, dominated by Britain and France, was a running sore an affront to Italian self-esteem and a barrier to dreams of overseas expansion. Mediterraneo, non sia il carcere che umilia il nostro vigore di vita. Ricordo che anni prima Mussolini fece... Although Mussolini hadn't traveled much abroad, he never discouraged the young ones from seeing the world for themselves. I remember him saying to us after a cruise, did you notice when you came through Gibraltar that nobody crosses it without Britain's go-ahead? Italy was shut in, and this bothered him. And he meant to put an end to it. Questo sistema, questa chiusura, che lui temeva e voleva far saltare. By comparison with the British and French, Italy's empire was insignificant. There was Libya, but oil had not yet been discovered. Italy controlled Eritrea and Somalia, and adjacent to both was Ethiopia, for many years an object of Italian ambition. People used to say that Italy shouldn't conquer Ethiopia. Why not? Hadn't England done the same thing? It had conquered India, it had conquered the Middle East, it had conquered half the world. We used to say, why them and not us? We were all agreed on that point. We were all convinced that Italy too deserved its fair share of all that land around the world, which till then had been shared out between England and France. Ethiopia, ruled by the Emperor Haile Selassie, was poor, backward and a black and it practiced slavery. In fascist eyes, therefore, Ethiopia was ripe for a white man's war of liberation. There were also economic arguments for conquest. Mussolini needed more than just raw materials, which Italy totally lacked. Mineral water is the only thing that Italy has a lot of. He needed mines, he needed raw materials. He also needed land for Italy's increasing population. In the 30s, 
We were increasing in number quite a lot. We needed to find a place for millions of Italians across the waters. And that is why we went to Ethiopia. Before beginning his expansion into Ethiopia, Mussolini asked Britain and France for their permission. The French gave their consent through Laval in January 1935. The English, on the other hand, remained ambiguous for months. A year earlier, Mussolini's daughter Edda had visited London. He had asked her how the British would react to an Italian invasion. Before I left, my father said, tell everybody that we're going to Ethiopia. Tell everyone from the porter at the station to the taxi driver. I did tell everybody. As regards the ordinary people, they didn't even know where Ethiopia was. Basically, they didn't care. Then I met MacDonald, who was the prime minister at the time. I insisted on knowing if the English would go to war against Italy. He said no. Well, I said, that was my main concern. Fine, he said. Then I added, but will you take any action? Yes, of course, but we won't make war. That's settled, I replied. I don't know if we shook hands across the table. I can't remember. Then he said, let's go and have a cup of tea on the terrace. Let's go and have a cup of tea on the terrace. Throughout the summer and autumn of 1935, an armada of Italian troop ships sailed for Italy's colonial bases in Africa. The build-up began with three divisions. To be on the safe side, Mussolini raised it to ten. It was a war for Italy and Italy was involved. The young ones like myself thought it was our duty to take part. Our grandfathers and fathers had brought about the unification of Italy. We thought the moment had come when it was our duty to make Italy great. On the 3rd of October, 1935, Italian troops invaded Ethiopia. It was the biggest and best equipped army ever to have fought in Africa in all one and a half million men. Mussolini expected a walkover. But Ethiopia's lightly armed and barefooted soldiers resisted valiantly. Within weeks, the Italian advance bogged down. But rifles and spears were no match for modern weapons and certainly no match for Italy's bombers. They had the sky to themselves. In a secret order, Mussolini approved the use of poison gas. In a convention ratified seven years earlier, Italy had renounced chemical warfare as uncivilized, and its use in Ethiopia was kept from the public in Italy until after the war. When the news caused an outcry abroad, Italy issued denials. Photographs of victims of gas attacks were described by the Italian embassy in London as cases of leprosy. But the evidence could not be refuted, and Italy was condemned across the world. In the League of Nations, Britain led a futile attempt to restrain Mussolini by imposing limited sanctions. Action must now be taken. It is for the members of the League of Nations collectively to determine what their reaction should be. All but four member nations voted for sanctions. Nobody wanted collective military action to force Italy to withdraw. The sanctions were painful, but all the League accomplished was to consolidate Italian support for the war. 
The Italians were deeply hurt and considered the sanctions a clear injustice and an obstacle in their rebuilding program. Mussolini had warned England and France of his plans in Ethiopia and had not been opposed. Instead, they later imposed sanctions. The party launched a battle to beat sanctions. Following the example of the Queen, a quarter of a million Roman matrons handed in their golden wedding rings to swell the national reserves of bullion. Their husbands donated bedsteads to the cause, anything of metal, anything at all, to feed the duchy's war machine. What Italians did not know was that the war and the collapse of Italy's foreign trade was wrecking the economic revival of the 20s. With victory in April 1936, there was blind rejoicing from the king and the pope to the crowds in the streets. Alone against the world, Italians had proved themselves as a nation of warriors. Rome was again the capital of an empire, and its creator Mussolini was admired and applauded as never before. Mussolini had brought fascism to its peak. It would be several years before the Italians began to count the cost of his ambitions. With Ethiopia, Italy had lost valued friends, and from now on, fascism was to go into gradual decline. Mussolini's addiction to war now drove Italians into a second expensive adventure the intervention of 50,000 troops in the civil war in Spain. In battle, his army did not distinguish itself, and at home, the official newsreels failed completely to arouse enthusiasm. Le Salmeria legionarie entrano in Castel Dance, occupata con felice colpo di mano alle tre di notte del 4 gennaio dai caristi legionari. La cittadina ci appare completamente devastata negli edifici, ingombra nelle vie e nelle piazze dagli sbarramenti di pietra con i quali i rossi hanno in vano tentato di arginare l'impeto dei carri legionari. Mussolini later admitted that two wars had bled Italy white. The diplomatic consequences were even greater. The Ethiopian war had taken Italy out of the Western camp, and Spain was drawing her closer to Nazi Germany. What drew the two dictators together was only partly ideology. Each needed the other. Hitler had taken advantage of the commotion over Ethiopia to reoccupy the Rhineland. Mussolini, impressed by this show of force, saw Hitler as an ally he could influence. I think that um... Uh, it, it was the fact that uh, Germany for him meant a young country in a position of uh, ascension, if you can say that. And uh, because of that, uh, he had better be with them than uh, to be with the countries that uh, he was considering somewhat decadent. That is the reason why I think uh, he forced himself I say forced himself to ally himself with the Germans because fundamentally, I think that Mussolini was not a lover of Germany or a lover of Germans, but he felt that uh, he could not avoid being ally of the Germans because uh, of the power which was coming out of the German people. In November 1936, Hitler and Mussolini formed what they called the Rome-Berlin Axis. It was a turning point in Italian history. Mussolini would lose control of his own foreign policy and Italy would become a German satellite. The fascists now began to imitate the Nazis. Mussolini ordered his army to adopt the German goose step. He called it the Passo Romano. 
The soldiers did their best to conform. But what shocked even hardened fascists was the Dulce's imposition of anti-Semitism in a set of laws discriminating against the Jews. I've always thought they were a mistake. Mussolini introduced the anti-Semitic laws because he was in a way obliged to by his alliance with Hitler. Our people, however, have never been racist. I was born in the Italian city of Ferrara, where the burgomaster has always been a Jew, Renzo Ravenna. A lot of the founders of the Fasci di Combattimento between 1919 and 1921 in many Italian cities were Jewish. Hatred was never felt nor displayed against the Jews. In Italy, they were never persecuted as they were in Germany. The new relationship was put to the test when Germany invaded Austria in 1938. Only four years earlier, Mussolini had blocked this ambition of Hitler by sending troops into the Brenner Pass. But Germany was now a major military power. Mussolini earned Hitler's undying gratitude by condoning the invasion in advance. After the Anschluss, Hitler was perfectly placed to threaten his next objective, Czechoslovakia. In the autumn of 1938, Europe was on the brink of war. The Munich Conference of September 1938 gave Mussolini a final opportunity to play a role on the European stage. By relaying to Hitler the British request for a last-minute meeting and by presenting as his own a settlement drafted by the Germans, he was able to pose as a saviour of world peace. In reality, he was an extra. The decisions at Munich were made by Neville Chamberlain and by Hitler. Later, Mussolini would recall with pride how Chamberlain had licked his boots. Mussolini returned to Italy to frenzied shouts of Duce. For the first time, Mussolini was acclaimed as a peacemaker. In January 1939, the hope that Mussolini would side with Britain and France brought the British Prime Minister on a mission to Rome. Mussolini had first proposed a general settlement to the British on the 5th of October 1935. This general settlement guaranteed Italy's cooperation in Europe against Germany. In return, Britain was to give Italy equal rights in the Mediterranean and a share in the sphere of influence in North Africa and the Middle East. Mussolini continued to put forward this proposal to the British right up to the outbreak of war in Europe and even during Italy's period of neutrality. Chamberlain wanted to detach Mussolini from Hitler, but Mussolini's price was too high. Four months later, Mussolini's foreign minister, Count Ciano, arrived in Berlin to sign a full-scale military alliance with Hitler. The German occupation of Prague, two months earlier, had caught Mussolini unawares. Briefly, he had considered switching to the side of Britain and France but it made more sense to stay with the stronger side. During the discussions, Ciano had stressed that Italy would not be ready for war until 1943. The Germans were evasive, and Mussolini ordered Ciano not to press the point. The agreement was signed. A week later, Mussolini wrote to Hitler, reminding him of Italy's need for a breathing space of three to four years. Hitler did not reply. In August, Ciano discovered that Germany was about to attack Poland. I returned to Rome completely disgusted with the Germans, with their leader, with their way of doing things. They have betrayed us and lied to us. Now they are dragging us into an adventure which we do not want, which may compromise the regime and the country as a whole. Mussolini had walked into a trap. He had repeatedly promised Hitler that the two fascist nations would march together. 
but his armed forces were in no state to fight a major war. In propaganda films, Italy's army was portrayed as among the most formidable in Europe, but Mussolini had neglected the military preparations his ambitions required. His soldiers carried rifles introduced in 1891. By the end of the Second World War, they had still not been replaced. His three armoured divisions existed only on paper. The army had no proper tanks. Military vehicles required for important parades were sometimes borrowed from the police. Italian artillery dated back to World War I. In the fascist Grand Council, Mussolini berated his generals for the army's deficiencies, but the fault was his. Italy's limited resources had been thrown away in four years of war in Ethiopia and Spain. As evidence of Italy's unreadiness, he now sent Hitler a shopping list that deliberately exaggerated Italy's needs. To fight alongside Germany, Italy would need 17 million tons of supplies. Hitler, bowing to the inevitable, released Mussolini from his military obligations. Most Italians were unaware of these high-level exchanges. Fascist propaganda had not prepared them for Hitler's invasion of Poland in September 1939. Qui in Italia vivevamo tutti in un modo di spensierata incoscienza. In Italy, we lived a normal, carefree life, blissfully unaware of what was happening outside our borders. So we worked, we sang, and we marched. The distant noise of war wasn't heard. Or perhaps we didn't want to hear it. I was on holiday, and the hotel I was staying in had given a big party. A lot of happy and cheerful people had been there. The following day, through my hotel window, I saw a crowd of people all extremely upset and shouting and running in the direction of the station. Cars, old carts and lorries were everywhere. Barefooted people, people on bikes. Everybody looked exceedingly worried. This was, of course, the outcome of the news they'd heard that morning. That is to say, the outbreak of war. Life continued as usual. Italy remained neutral, or non-belligerent, as Mussolini preferred to call it. He vacillated, ashamed to be neutral, unwilling to join Hitler until a German victory seemed certain, and, in spite of his alliance, still tempted to try to bargain with the Allies. During the period of non-belligerence, Mussolini continued to put forward his proposals to Britain. On several occasions, he let them know that he was prepared to break the Pact of Steel if Britain and France were ready to make concessions in the Mediterranean and give Italy the guarantee that she would be given protection against Germany. Mussolini's proposals were ignored. In May 1940, Mussolini's doubts were swept away by Hitler's successful offensive on the Western Front. Italy, he announced, cannot remain absent when the fate of Europe is at stake. The aerei sorvolano le opere fortificate francesi, prolungamento della linea Maginot, lungo le frontiere del Lussemburgo e del Belgio fino al mare. La formidabile barriera è stata infranta dal valore e dallo spirito di sacrificio dei soldati del Reich. On the 10th of May, German armies invaded Holland and Belgium. Mussolini waited. Ten days later, his generals warned him that the end of the war was in sight. If he waited much longer, he might miss a place at the peace table and a share of the spoils. Not until the 10th of June, a fortnight after the British retreat from Dunkirk, did Mussolini take his long-suffering country into yet another war. I tedeschi avevano vinto tutti. 
the German victory was complete. The Germans had been betrayed by Italy in 1914 and looked like being betrayed by them again in 1939. Well, what was the fate going to be of an ally that could not be trusted? Everything at this point persuaded him to enter the war. L'ora delle decisioni irrevocabili. La dichiarazione di guerra è già stata consegnata agli ambasciatori. Hitler's military success, aided by Mussolini's tried and trusted propaganda machine, pointed to a quick and easy victory. The people cheered, as they had done for 17 years. But as the crowd left the square, there was a change of mood. Looking out of the window from Palazzo Chigi, where I was at the time, we didn't see any youths excited about the prospect of a war. We saw instead rather thoughtful people who were going home with folded flags, asking themselves those questions they hadn't thought of in the square. On the 22nd of June, a full week after the Germans occupied Paris, Mussolini decided that Italian prestige required an Alpine offensive against the fatally weakened French. The attack was a farce. Italy's greatly superior force suffered heavy losses and was saved only by the collapse of France. In the years that followed, defeat in battle became the norm. Mussolini's addiction to minor wars of conquest had led him to throw his country into a war of major powers for which he had left Italy unprepared and hopelessly ill-equipped. His grand design of turning easy-going Italians into a nation of cold-blooded warriors was always an illusion. Mussolini united and modernized Italy. He influenced Europe. But he misused his enormous personal power and misled his people. Years later, a fellow countryman looked back on Mussolini's hold on Italians. He wrote, they saw in him only the tenor for whom they raved as they had raved years before for Caruso. As one does with tenors, they enjoyed his long notes and the melody without paying attention to the words. If they had listened more carefully, they would not have been surprised by the catastrophe later, for Mussolini had announced it. <laughs> 